We are doing a series called The Basics of Healthy Spirituality, and on Thursday, I got coffee with my mentor, Pastor Kim Krogstad, and we sat down over coffee, and Kim is a member here at this church, and she asked me a question that only a pastor asks to another pastor. She said, how's this series going for you? And I said, oh, it's going well. I'm enjoying it. I've gotten to talk about how God transcends religious lines, and it's been a lot of fun for me. And she looked at me with a very nice, polite smile, and then very kindly asked, have you uh, defined what spirituality is in this series? And I thought to myself, uh, nope. And before she could say anything, I jumped in and said, but I have a feeling that I should probably do that next. <laughs> because we are talking about the basics of healthy spirituality, and we are in part four of this series, and you may be thinking to yourself, I still have no idea what spirituality is. You're not alone. I forgot to define this back four weeks ago. So a little late, we're going to define what spirituality is so we can talk about what healthy spirituality means. So I always like to, when I'm defining uh, different terms within religious uh, circles and religious language, I like to go to the dictionary and start there and see if the dictionary has a great definition to start. So I went to merriamwebster.com and I looked up spirituality and the definition they gave me was sensitivity or attachment to religious values. And that made me want to throw up. I thought it was a terrible, <laughs> awful definition of spirituality. So then I went to the new Oxford American Dictionary, which came up with the definition, the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. That is a much better definition, but it honestly puts me to sleep. It is a boring definition, even if it's technically accurate. So for me, what spirituality is, and it may be different for you, but the best definition I could come up with after talking with Kim on Thursday to today is that spirituality for me is one's relationship with the entire experience of being human. And yes, there are intersections with the divine. I would put the divine a lot in the experience of being human. But for me, the entire experience of being human and how we are related to it or how we are in relationship with it can be very healthy or very unhealthy. And so this series is using Christian language and the Christian tradition and Christian stories to talk about how we can be in a healthy relationship with the entire experience of being human. And so we have gone through the basics. We've come up with six basics. We are on part four of this series. And we've talked about how these basics have practical applications. So three weeks ago, we talked about God is good. And the application that we tried to talk about and how that plays out in our life is that it is good to be human. I think all healthy spirituality begins with a conviction that it is good to be alive on this planet right here. Then the next week, we talked about how God is love, and we talked about how God is less an object to be worshipped and more present in the experience of love. And that showed us an, on, a, on a practical standpoint that growing in love is the most important task we have. This is what all of this religiosity is for, is to help us to become more loving people. We don't love so that we might become more religious. Then the third part, last week, we talked about how God is alive and how if we think that God will ask us to do the same thing generation after generation after generation, we're actually worshiping a dead God. And if God is alive, then God has to lead us to surprising and new spaces, and God will also ask all of us to change drastically at some point in our life. And what the application behind that was is that people can change, and it's worth celebrating. And it's sometimes hard to forget that people can change, and so that's why we believe in a God who is alive. Now, this is all very religious language. We are talking about this from the Christian perspective. I know we have atheists and agnostics here, so I want you to know I have not forgotten about you. My hope is when we talk about all of the basics of healthy spirituality, my wish for all of you, my atheist and agnostic friends, is that this series in some way, shape, or form helps you to love being human on this planet. And so that is what this series is about, and that leads us into God is Everywhere, part four, which is today. And I want to begin with a story that took place 4,000 years ago on the other side of the world. Now, if you travel to the other side of the world, it would look like this today. It looked very similar to this 4,000 years ago in 2000 BCE. To help orient ourselves, uh, today there is a city there that most people know that is Jerusalem. 4,000 years ago, it was not known as Jerusalem. It was known as Rusalimim. Rusalimim, I practiced it and I can't get it in front of you all. Rusalimim, 
And it was not a Hebrew city at that point, but there are archaeological digs that have shown people inhabited it back 4,000 years ago. That's not where our story unfolds. Our story unfolds to the south in a place called Bir Lahai Roy. Let me hear you say Bir Lahai Roy. Yes, beer means the well, and Lahai Roy means of the living one who sees me. It's a very beautiful name. And there's a well there, and this is where the this, this story unfolds. Now, this story unfolds with two main characters. They are Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac is the son of Abraham, and this story begins shortly after Abraham's death. Now, Isaac and Sarah are struggling with infertility, so they pray to God to have a baby. And they pray and they pray, and finally God answers their prayer and allows Rebecca to become pregnant. And as Rebecca grows in pregnancy, eventually time comes for deliver, and wouldn't you know it, back then they were very surprised to find that she was not pregnant with just one baby, but two babies. She had twins named Jacob and Esau. And these two grew up in this area of the world 4,000 years ago, only knowing each other's company and knowing that life with the other brother was just part of how they experienced this whole earth. Well, this went by for several decades, or several decades, uh, to the point where Jacob and Esau became young men. And as they became young men, it became very apparent to their parents that they were both very good at different things. Esau was a warrior. He loved to hunt. He loved to be outdoors. Jacob loved to be inside. Jacob loved to do things around the house. And Jacob was dearly beloved by his mother, while Esau was dearly beloved by his father. And there's one day, while Esau was out hunting, Jacob was home making a lentil stew. And he was there making the stew when Esau returned from the hunt absolutely famished. Now, I don't know if Esau was being sarcastic or dramatic, but Esau said to Jacob, I need food or I'm going to die. So, I have said something similar like that in my life. I didn't actually mean it. I'm not sure if Esau meant it, but those are the words that are in the book of Genesis. Now, it's here that Jacob stirs the pot, both metaphorically and literally, because he does not say, here, my brother, who is about to die, let me give you some stew. Instead, Jacob acts like he owns like a major league baseball team, and instead of just saying, here's a soda, he charges him $9 for a soda that only cost him 17 cents, right? <laughs> he says, Esau, if you want some of my stew, I want your birthright, which was the most valuable possession Esau had, being the oldest son. He was entitled to take over the, fa the family business, the family property, the family possessions, and Jacob, eventually, when his father passed away, would have to either live with his brother as kind of his employee or servant, or Jacob would have to move away. So Jacob says, why don't you give all of that right to your inheritance to me in exchange for lentils? So in other words, what Jacob is doing here is Jacob is saying to Esau, the cost of this stew is your house, your job, and your 401k. <laughs> and I don't know if Esau is dumb I don't know if Esau was literally about to die, but Esau says, fine, just give me the stew, and he takes it, he eats it. The Bible never describes how good the stew tastes or does not taste. Instead, all we get is that Esau therefore despised his birthright, and who wouldn't, right? And that's the end of the story that takes place at Bir Lahai Roy. Now, in the next chapter... Isaac takes his family with Jacob and Esau and Rebekah to the north. They settle in a new place called Beersheba. Let me hear you say Beersheba this morning. And here in Beersheba, another story unfolds which doesn't really acknowledge the story with the stew in the lentils. But this story takes place at the end of Isaac, the father's life. We read in Genesis, when Isaac was so old that his eyesight had failed, he became aware that he was about to die. And so he walked into one of his tents at Beersheba and laid down on a bed, and he was painfully aware that this would become his deathbed. Becoming aware of his own impending mortality, Isaac sent for Esau and said to Esau, Esau, I want you to go out and hunt some food and bring me back your own meal. We're going to eat a meal together, and then I'm going to transfer my, uh, my possessions to you. I'm going to acknowledge your birthright and bless you so that you can now take over this whole family enterprise. 
Esau is honored and sad. He leaves the tent to go hunt. And there in the corner of the tent is none other than Rebecca, Isaac's wife, Jacob's mother, who once again loves Jacob more. And she goes to Jacob and says, you're about to lose everything. Why don't we come up with a plan to trick your father and my husband and have him give everything to you instead of Esau, even though he intends to give it to Esau? And Jacob's like, no, no, okay, okay, sure. Um, and Jacob says, but I'm worried because I'm not as hairy as Esau. How are we going to make, convince him, even though he can't see, that I'm actually Esau? And it's here that uh, Rebecca comes up with a plan where she says, we have two goats out back. Why don't you kill the goats, bring it to me, I'll make a meal, and then I'll also take the skins of the goats and I will make it clothing for you so that when Esau touches you, it'll be hairy like a goat and he'll be like, oh, this feels like Esau. Now, time out real quick. <laughs> I don't know, I've never made clothes from goat skin, in case you're wondering. I feel like there has to be a drying process at some point. Am I, am I the only one that feels this? I feel like you can't just kill a goat and then wear it and have everything be fine. But that's not in the Bible, so we're going to ignore it for right now. But I just have to acknowledge it. Okay, time back in. So Jacob goes and kills the goats. <laughs> Rebecca, in one fell swoop, uh, makes clothes and food out of it and then sends Jacob into Isaac's tent where he's on his deathbed and says, it's time. Isaac, I'm sorry, Jacob walks in and says, Father, and immediately, Isaac is skeptical because he recognizes the voice of Jacob. Isaac says to Jacob, which of my sons are you? And uh, the son responds by saying, I am Esau, your firstborn, which may I remind you, it's Jacob saying that, who, in case you forgot, is not Esau, right? And so Isaac is confused, and he keeps going. He says, how did you find the food so quickly? How did you come back from the hunt so quickly, my child? And Jacob doesn't say, well, I just killed the goats in the back because why waste time? Uh, Jacob instead says, well, it was Yahweh God who provided an offering for me and allowed me to return so quickly from the hunt. To which I picture God watching this scene unfold up in heaven and thinking, don't you dare drag me into this. <laughs> and it's here that East, uh, Isaac keeps asking questions. Let me touch you because I need to be able to tell if you really are Esau. And so Jacob steps forward wearing goat skin, and uh, Isaac feels him, and he says, oh, the voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's. And the text just reads, and Isaac was confused. He's been confused this whole time, he's been skeptical this whole time, and he's not really sure what to believe. And there's this pause that happens in this part of the story, and it's here that Isaac says one of the most vulnerable questions in all of scripture. And as I read it, it pulls on my heartstrings because it's such a vulnerable question. He says into the darkness, because he's blind, he says, are you really Esau? And Jacob says, I am. And it's here that Isaac decides that he's going to be resigned to this no matter what it is. And he says, come then closer Esau and kiss me. And so Jacob approaches his father and kisses him on the cheek. And Isaac then smelled Esau's scent on the clothes, and he gave Jacob his blessing. And Jacob quickly got out of the tent. Shortly thereafter, Esau returns and walks into the tent, and Isaac is once again confused and says, I've already blessed your brother. He must have tricked me. And Esau become, became filled with rage. The text tells us that Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing Isaac had given him. And he goes on to think to himself, it won't be long before we will be mourning Isaac, a.k.a. my dad will die. After that, then I will kill Jacob, which is a very considerate way to commit murder. Um, it's just really thoughtful to think about your dad in that moment. But Esau starts acting like he's going to murder Jacob. And Rebecca notices, so she goes to Jacob and says, you've got to get out of here because Esau is going to murder you. Um, I, I think the best thing you can do is get far away from here. I want you to go to the place of my ancestors and my family, to the place called Haran. And you may be wondering where Haran is. Well, Haran is to the north, but it's nowhere on this map. Haran is all the way up here uh, in modern-day in modern Assyria, and Haran is about 450 miles away from Beersheba, which is the equivalent of a drive to San Francisco from here. 
And so Rebecca says, you need to get really far away, and you got to go to Haran. And so Jacob, after talking with his father briefly, runs away and heads north on a 450-mile journey to Haran. And on the first night, he has run as far away from home as he possibly can in one day, and he kind of collapses, and he falls down, and he starts to think about what he's done before he drips off to sleep. And as he sleeps, he receives a vision from God in which he sees a ladder extending from his place here on earth all the way up to heaven. And there are angels going up and angels going down this entire ladder. And it is an awe-inspiring and bewildering sight to behold. And then as Jacob is taking all of this in in his dream, God begins to speak to Jacob with these words, I am Yahweh, the God of Sarah and Abraham and the God of Rebekah and Isaac. Your descendants will be like the specks of dust on the ground. You will spread to the east and to the west, to the north, to the south, and all the tribes of the earth will bless themselves by you and your descendants. Know that I am with you. I will keep you safe wherever you go and bring you back to this land. I will not desert you before I have done all that I have promised you. And Jacob becomes so excited that he all of a sudden jolts awake and he sees all the stars that he fell asleep underneath. And while there have been people who have spent all kinds of time and hours dedicated to try and figure out what the ladder means and what the symbolism all means, it's all a waste compared to what Jacob says next. Jacob says, truly, Yahweh is in this place and I never knew it. In other words, Jacob who is a biblical figure, is shocked to find God in the wilderness. Because Jacob has only known living, living in Beersheba and the place before where his family settled. He's only known living with his family, and he's heard about how they worship the God of Isaac and Abraham. He's heard about how God is everywhere, but he's only lived in one place only with his family, and he's kind of adapted to that place and thought, okay, well, God is everywhere here. And so Jacob heads out, runs away from family for the first time, and he's leaving his family, his possessions behind, and he also assumes that he is leaving God behind. And so here he is, the furthest away he's ever been from home. He has this vision, and he wakes up, he says, who knew? God's here too? I didn't think God would be this far away from my dad Isaac. Now it's here that we have to ask a very important question. Did God follow Jacob from Beersheba into the wilderness? Or was God already in the wilderness where Jake, when Jacob wandered into it? Of course, God was already in the wilderness when Jacob wandered into it, right? Because God does not just live over one family. And while I believe that Jacob knew that God lived everywhere, he had never experienced firsthand until he set out, ran away from home, and as, as far as he could be away from home, he woke up and said, God's here too? Who knew? Now, it's here we have to laugh a little bit, right? Because Jacob uh, is on a journey to Haran, which is about 450 miles north. This is day one of his journey. And he thinks he's basically at the edge of the earth. But really, he's made it to here, where the white star is. It's about 40 miles away from Beersheba, which would eventually become Bethel. And it's like, imagine that Jacob lived here in Redlands his whole life. And we talked to Jacob and we knew who he was. And Jacob said he believed that God was everywhere, um, but he never left Redlands. And so one day, Jacob leaves when he's 20 years old. He leaves, he goes away from the weekend. We're all shocked because Jacob never leaves. And he comes back on a Monday and we're like, Jacob, how are you? He's like, you wouldn't believe what I saw. We say, what'd you see, Jacob? He said, I found God all the way in Temecula. Who knew God could be that big? And that's the relative distance that Jacob has his mind blown because he never thought God would be that far away from his family. And rather than saying, oh yeah, I know God will be everywhere, he wakes up and says, I just didn't even think God would be out here. And this is a story about a man waking up to the awareness that God is everywhere. And if you think about what this story is telling us today, I do not care if this is your first time in church or your 100th time in church. The story is not 
that once you believe in this, you will understand God and everything will work out perfectly. No, the story is that God is everywhere and this will surprise us at some point. You can be the most enlightened scholar there is and you will still at some point be surprised by God showing up in a place you did not expect God to be, right? God is everywhere is essential for healthy spirituality because it teaches us that there is something bigger than us but also something valued within us. Let's play a little game, shall we? I want to ask you, where is God more present? Is God more present at a Bible study or is God more present at a bar? The answer, of course, is yes. God is equally present at both because God is everywhere. Is God more present at a Hillsong United concert or is God more present at a Smashing Pumpkins concert? The answer is yes. God is equally present at both because God is everywhere. To say God is more here than there is to testify to a God who is only in some places and not all places. But let's take this a little further, shall we? Is God more present in a church or is God more present in a mosque? Yes, of course God is present in both equally because God is everywhere. God is not somewhere more than somewhere else. And the whole idea that God is everywhere should greatly increase your appreciation, not only for other religions, but also your own religion. Because if you believe that God is infinite, and that God is omnipresent, that God is everywhere, then when you look back through the annals of history, you start to think to yourself, wait, 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 was God only present with this small select group of people in the Middle East during this time as the Bible is being written? Or was God present with all the people on earth that were existing at the same time? Well, of course God was present with everyone equally. And that means that you can find hints and pieces as to what it is that people describe about the divine in other religions, and they can, you can welcome them as your teacher rather than opposition to be crushed. And the reason you can do this is because you can believe that God is everywhere. Now, let's be very clear about something. This is not saying we have the truth and everyone has a lesser truth and they're all eventually going to come to us because we've got it and they're like all figuring it out when they'll one day work toward what we have in Christianity. That's not what this is. This is all of us using different names to describe the same thing. This is all of us interacting with God nearby to the best of our abilities and finding value in our experience, our culture, our people, the people around us, and then also the people beyond us. Because when you consider the entire globe, you have to trust that if you believe in the infinite God and that God is everywhere, that God is so close not only to you, but to everyone else as well. Think about this for a moment. If you really believe that God is everywhere, then no one in human history has ever been closer to God than you are right now. On October 5, 2024, no one has ever been closer to God than you are right now. What's also true is that you are not closer to God than anyone else you encounter. You've not been closer to God than anyone else. Because when we talk about what it means to be human, the whole idea between human and God is that there is a relationship between the two, and God is not in parts more than in some other parts of the world. And when we talk about healthy spirituality, it's our relationship with the entire experience of being human, and anyone who was born on this planet and is human has been born into the presence of God. Now, this may seem like a lot, but we are only scratching the surface. Because if you think about this story, this story is counterintuitive on every level imaginable. Think about Jacob. The moment before he falls asleep and has a vision from God and is convinced that God is with him there in the wilderness, right? I don't know about you, but right before I fall asleep, I think about all of my worst life choices at the same time. Is that anybody else here? <laughs> okay, I feel very lonely. I feel very lonely with that. But that's very true for me. I think about uh, John Green, one of my favorite authors, describes it as my mind decides to play the blooper reel right before I go to sleep. <laughs> so let's assume Jacob does this, right? 
He's run away from home for the first time. Let's do a quick recap of what Jacob's done. He extorted his brother with the lentil stew. He exploited a disability. He lied to his dying father. He lied to his father again. 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 And he lied to his father again before he stole everything from his brother. Now, what's crazy, and I mean crazy, is that all of this led Jacob to God. I was raised in church school. I was told that if I wanted to be led to God, I needed to read my Bible and pray. No one said, why don't you try lying to your father, as the Bible says, and see how close that brings you to God. You might get a vision out of it, right? This should not lead to God. And yet Jacob does these things. He runs away from home. And at his absolute lowest, all of a sudden God's like, I am with you. And he's like, really? Yeah, really, Jacob. It's hard to believe because this is pretty nasty stuff. But if you believe that God is everywhere, not only is God everywhere in a physical location, not only is God everywhere in a time and history location, when it comes to our human actions, there is nothing beyond the redemption of God. There is nothing you can do to walk out of God's presence. There is nowhere you can go. There's no mess you can make that is so big that God's like, oh, well, good luck. Good luck out there. It's going to be rough fixing that. Because this is pretty nasty. And at the same time, this is the moment when God meets Jacob. Now, I want to tell you a story, and I do not know the, the main character in the story. I do not know her religious identity. So I do not want to put my own religious beliefs on her story or use her story to advance my religion. But she said something recently that embodies this idea, whether it's from a spiritual or, uh, or a non-human kind of perspective. So um, the story starts at the University of California, Irvine, where a woman named Kiki enrolled as a freshman and she was a bio pre-med major. Are there any bio pre-med majors or people that did this in, in college? I expected way more. Oh, people are just, <laughs> I saw people burying their head in their hands. You are loved, you are welcome here. So she was a bio pre-med major at UCI. She was loving life, or was she? By the time she graduated, she's like, I don't wanna go to med school. I don't know why I thought I wanted to go to med school. If you're in med school, you're welcome here, you're on the right path, don't worry. So anyways, she decided to pursue her other passion, which was music. And Kiki joined a band with her friends from UCI. It was a band called Nylon Pink. She was the lead guitarist in this band. And they toured all around. If you've never toured with a band, I've heard it's a very hard life because people kind of hate you when you show up on stage and they take out their aggressions on you. But if you love the music, you can keep going through it. But they didn't really gain notoriety and they weren't well known. But she loved the music so much that she kept going on tour after tour. She kept playing the small crowds, some bigger crowds, small crowds. It was never a linear journey for her. Eventually, she found some success as a travel blogger, and she started doing this travel blog, teaching people how to travel economically and efficiently and effectively. And it started getting about 100,000 views per month. And while she liked the travel blog, it was never her main passion, which was music. So she joined another band, and they toured around, and while it was good, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that somebody would stop and be like, wow, that's a show-stopping like, live event. I think they put on really good shows, but it was just never like a massive sea of people. And so as Kiki continued to grow up, she'd been doing this for about 15 years, um, it was time for her to say, like, you know, I think I want to settle down and start a family. So her and her partner got pregnant, um, and as she looked back at this time, this picture was taken in 2023, so just last year. As she looked back in 2024, she remembers it this way. She says, I thought my touring days were over since I have a little kiddo now. The kid was born in 2023. Um, I sort of gave up hope on any future tours, though my dream was always to play a, to a sea of people in the audience. So she has this baby. She's accepted that she's a mom now. Parents, we all know that's a kind of social death that we all accept, um, and it's the best thing ever. Don't worry, don't worry. But it's part of what life is, right? So she never had much aspiration beyond that, and she never thought, like, okay, what's going to happen afterwards? But then, one of my favorite bands ever, the Smashing Pumpkins, who were really big in the 90s and uh, still can put on a great show, in my opinion, 
uh, announced they were going to go on a world tour, but one of their guitarists left. So they held an open audition for anyone who wanted to join the Smashing Pumpkins, and they said, if you have an interest in joining our band, just send us a video of you playing, and we'll consider you to join our band. They got over 10,000 applicants. And they went through all kinds of videos. I've read interviews with Billy Corgan and James Iha about this. They went through all kinds of uh, videos and just poured over these different things. They eventually got to Zoom interviews. After Zoom interviews, they started inviting people to come out and play with them and jam with them. And one of the people who caught their eye was Kiki Wong. They invited her to come out. They played together, and the day after, Billy Corgan, the lead singer, called Kiki Wong and said, we'd like to invite you to join the Smashing Pumpkins. And uh, that was in March of 2024. In June of 2024, she went on a world tour with the Smashing Pumpkins. You can see her all the way there on your left side. Um, and I've seen the live videos. I didn't get to see them when they were here in LA, but she shreds and brings a dynamic energy to this band that I've been listening to for <laughs> 30 years now, which is kind of hard to say out loud. <laughs> but one thing that really touched Kiki was the fact that she got to play SoFi Stadium in LA with the Smashing Pumpkins, and this was her home show. And she took a picture with her partner and their son backstage about before she's about to go on stage with the Smashing Pumpkins. And just this week on Wednesday, she looked back at this because this was a break in the tour, and she looked back on this journey that she had no idea she would be on in 2023, right? And the words she chose were quite profound. She said, I'm used to working exponentially hard for a handful of successes and a majority of failures, but try agains or do-overs. I'm used to goals just being right outside of reach and making more sacrifices than reaping the fruits of my labor. Because I've been rejected so much, I no longer fear it. I now have a second chance at pursuing my dreams. Because I've been rejected so much, I no longer fear it. And when I think about this story, this story, in my opinion, talks about that definition of spirituality. And when I think about Kiki's story and how all the things that she went through and all those tour stops and all the times it didn't work out and the crowd was smaller than she expected, what I hear her telling everyone is, e you can love being human even with all of its rejections because part of being human is getting rejected. And when we consider what spirituality is, it's the entire experience of being human and not just the convenient parts. And so how is it that you find love for this experience with the really hard and difficult things that you and I face? Now, shifting back to our religious story, where we can use the religious language easily, um, this is a story about somebody who's really made a mess of things and somehow found God in the midst of it. Now, this is not saying something like, well, everything happens for a reason. That's a little too easy to say that, right? Instead, this is, I made a mess of things, and before I even tried to make things right, I became aware that God was still with me and still present in my life. I was aware that this is a mess, and yet I am still loved by my creator, and that my creator has not forgotten me. And decades after this vision occurs, Jacob does finally go back to Beersheba. He goes back. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know how Esau is going to react to him. He just travels back and says, I hope he's not mad anymore. And there's this scene in Scripture where Esau and Jacob meet one another in the middle of a field, and Jacob bows down low, and Esau rushes to embrace him as a brother. And what I love about this story is this is a story about Esau's forgiveness. And Esau forgives someone who, in my opinion, doesn't deserve it. And even though Jacob is the main character of the story, he's also the villain of the story. He's the one who causes all of this suffering, all of this heartache. Esau's the one who has to pay the price. And yet Esau, off camera, not in scripture, in his own story, finds a way to forgive Jacob, even though Jacob has made his own life a mess. And so while we don't have Esau's story, what it reminds me of is that God is truly everywhere. 
even in the stories of Scripture we don't have. Have you ever been wronged by someone? If you have, healthy spirituality is about how we embrace or understand or be in a good relationship with that letdown, right? And while I love this story from the Jewish tradition about a brother forgiving another brother that's wronged him, in the Christian tradition, we have our own story about someone who has been wronged by other people around him and found meaning and purpose in God's presence. That's, of course, the story of Jesus Christ on the cross who lived through the worst betrayal and extreme pain and oppression, and he also lived in poverty, and yet we profess that that was the very presence of God there on the cross. You see, the cross for us reminds us that God is everywhere, even in the betrayals and the heartaches and the uncertainties and the friends that treat us poorly or whoever it may be. Any suffering we encounter is embodied on the cross and is a reminder that while it isn't easy to make peace with all of this, God is with us in the midst of this mess. I tell you all of this because I know all of you have different stresses, anxieties, uncertainties, and challenges you are facing. I believe that no matter what it is that you're facing, you can still find a way to love your human experience. You can still find a way to love God in the midst of this, even if you are upset with God. I believe it's possible for you to find happiness in this life no matter what it is that you have faced. And I believe that you can do all of this whether you're part of a religion or not. And for many of us here, this religion has helped us make peace with this entire human experience. But if you found it outside of this religion, that's more than fine because we trust it because we know that God is everywhere. And so my friends, may you look at the cross and remind yourself that you will one day be surprised like Jacob when you discover that God is in the places where God simply should not be. And may you experience for yourself firsthand that God is truly everywhere. Amen.